Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. I thought that mental health would be much more important to this book. It turned out to not really be important at all in some ways. It's like it's not about mental health at all, actually. You know, at least in some, in some, in some, in many of these situations, it's, it's about control. Welcome to the Madden America podcast. My name is Leah Harris. And I'm so, so pleased to introduce to the listeners Dr. Anthony Ryan Hatch. Dr. Hatch is a sociologist and associate professor of science in society, African-American studies, and environmental studies at Wesleyan University, who studies how medicine and technology impact social inequalities in health. Professor Hatch is the author of two books, his first book, Blood Sugar, Racial Pharmacology and Food Justice in Black America, critiques how biomedical scientists, government researchers, and drug companies use the concepts of race and ethnicity to study and treat metabolic syndrome, a biomedical construct that identifies people at high risk of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. His second book, Silent Cells, The Secret Drugging of Captive America, examines how custodial institutions like prisons, nursing homes, and the U.S. military use psychotropic drugs to manage mass incarceration and captivity in the United States. Welcome to the Madden America podcast, Tony. It's so, so good to have you. Thank you, Leah. It's so good to be with you. In the preface of your book, Silent Cells, you talk about not wanting to participate in what's called liberal science, but more in a form of liberatory social science that would really challenge America's unique brand of mass incarceration. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about how you came to this orientation and how it's informed your work. I had just graduated from graduate school and joined a, a small group of other uh, self-identified Black you know, uh, assistant professors in this really small uh, postdoctoral fellowship at the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. And that fellowship was designed to have us focus on issues of HIV and AIDS, mental health and, and substance use inside prisons and jails in correctional settings, as it was phrased. So I joined these, these, this other group of, of Black scholars, and we're all trying to get a foothold in the academy and get our careers going. And we were... Um, visited that, that first summer and the first kind of summer program by a whole range of experts um, in, you know, in corrections, in health policy, um, really, you know, epidemiologists, a bunch of folks. Um, and, you know, the whole point of this, this fellowship was to kind of, pre, uh, you know, professionalize us, to get us ready to, to enter into the grant mill, you know, start writing grants and, and get funding and, and publish papers and, you know, develop our careers. And, you know, the, the logic is pretty simple. You know, you, you, you take this, it's kind of a bribe. <laughs> you take this money, right? And then you, in some ways, you have to compromise on the kinds of questions you want to ask, right? You have to ask the kinds of questions that institutions of power want answered. So if you're asking, you know, questions that have to do with the least among us, it's harder to get funding for that. So we were all encouraged to pursue relatively safe and, and clear and clean research projects that, you know, in the areas of, say, re-entry. Some of my, my colleagues were looking at issues of important issues of re-entry, right? It wasn't not to say that, that people who are doing um, social science and health research that is institutionally funded, because I certainly have had my own institutional funding, it's not to say that those things, that work can't be important. But, um, you know, I just saw it as hugely contradic- contradictory that you know we were going to, you know trying to understand mass incarceration and and study incarceration and do so safely kind of from the safe shores of, of liberal science that you know the, the and the basic idea is that you know you're producing information you're producing knowledge that can be used to reform institutions right and that's the basic idea of the liberal liberal approach to government right we produce science that science is supposed to help us make right decisions about policy but as I uncovered in this book and in the research that began right there in that summer, you know, sometimes you don't have all the information you need. Sometimes there, 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 people haven't been asking the right kinds of questions. And so you really have to sit back and think about what questions need to be to be answered. And so, it, you know, it seemed to me that 
that in terms of health researchers, there weren't enough people looking at the prison and thinking about incarceration from a critical point of view, from a, a point of view that wanted to liberate people from the prison, um, wanted to, as opposed to just simply reform, you know, the, those institutions really seeking to undermine them, not, and not just challenge their logic, right, just challenge the ideas, but to really be a tool that can be used toward abolitionist ends. I just didn't, I didn't want to do a project on the prisons that, that kept the prisons going or that made the prisons, you know, smarter or stronger, or give them greater capacity for holding people captive. And so, you know, that, that was, was part of my, part of my, my thinking in, in, in making that claim. And, and I, I try, I, you know, it's, it's very difficult to adhere to that, but I tried to do that in this project. Thank you so much. I appreciate how you really highlight the ways in which research can serve the aims of reform and also really can, in some ways, help to uphold and reinforce uh, the status quo. So I'm wondering if you could share just a little bit more of the story kind of surrounding how this book actually came to be. So at that so first, this is in the summer of 2009, we were the group of, of, of young scholars. We were all visited by a, uh, uh, a woman who worked for she had a brand new job at a for-profit prison healthcare company called GeoCare. And she had, for some period of time prior to that, had been one of the lead psychiatrists. I think she was the head psychiatrist in the Georgia Department of Corrections. And so she had given us a presentation about you know, the kind of inside insider's view of what was happening in terms of, of prisoner mental health and prisoner mental health care. And, you know, was a very, very obviously very savvy and, and experienced and smart person. And, you know, at, at that point in the summer's work, I had already been thinking about ways of, of bridging my previous work on racism in medicine um, and, metal, and, and metabolic health. That was part of my dissertation and that became the book Blood Sugar. I was th- trying to think about ways to connect what I had been doing in that world to this world that I was now in. And the, it, it came to me that I would want to, I kind of wanted to kind of follow drugs in the prison. You know, part, one of the things I looked at in my first project was the um, pharmaceuticals that, that treat metabolic disorder, including pharmaceuticals that cause metabolic disorder. And so, you know, the, the, as I explored in that first book, you know, I was looking at, um, at second generation antipsychotic medications and the, the fact that they cause, you know, weight gain, uh, dyslipidemia, they raise blood sugar, and they essentially cause the condition known as metabolic syndrome. And so I, I had already been thinking about that. So I began to, kind of, I wanted to follow drugs into the prison. And so I asked this former prison psychiatrist, um, what she thought about the use of psychotropic drugs inside the prison. And, you know, she kind of rocked back on her heels and smirked and said, well, let me put it to you this way. Each year, the warden sends me and my staff a nice bottle of something because he knows we keep the prison quiet. And you know, it was a remarkable thing for her to have said. And, in, on one hand, fed into the kind of conspiratorial, you know, framework that has, in some ways, been justified by the, by the, the, the massiveness of our system. Uh, you know, I think the, the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander certainly describes the mass in, system of mass incarceration, you know, as a conspiracy <laughs> um, to re-enslave Black people and other people of color and and, the, and America's poor. And so, but I wanted to know if she was right. You know, it was it the case that prisons were using psychotropic drugs to kind of keep the prison on lockdown, right? A psychic lockdown. There had been, there was so little published about this practice that it just, this is hence why I even asked her. And so that was in 2009. And that began for me what became a 10 year long slow bake investigation of the relationship between psychotropic drugs and and captivity more broadly institutional captivity in the US more broadly you know i it began with this focus on prisons and i obviously set out to try to to see whether the good doctors you know uh, aphorism was 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 it was it true uh, and i can come back to that in a minute but you know I, as soon as i began looking at the prison i began to see connections to other institutions 
that function just like much like prisons. And so then began to, to really wonder, on the one hand, we know that psychotropic drugs, when used in, used properly and carefully monitored, perhaps even in uh, ideally under very short-term conditions, can be helpful to people who are suffering from forms of psychic trauma, right, and life trauma. But the, the rules and the laws and the regulations of these institutions, when given this powerful technology, <laughs> create kind of perversions of power, whereby people who are held in these institutions, they're not always getting care as such, right? The, the, the drugging isn't always just about their mental health and improving it. Sometimes these drugs can be used to subordinate. And, and so I wanted to try to investigate that, that boundary between when we're using a drug uh, ostensibly for, for, for the right reason and when we're, when we're using them for the, for the wrong reason and how, how those two systems together uphold mass incarceration and in what role they play in upholding mass incarceration. You know, it turned out to be the case though, I have to tell you that, you know, it was very difficult to actually answer whether the doctor was right, the psychiatrist, was she, was she correct? I mean, that turned out to be a very difficult empirical question for me to answer. I take a stab at it in this book with the available evidence and, and tried to make the best, cl- the best case that I could. So you discussed just how difficult it was to obtain data on how psychotropics are being used in prison in general across all different functions. And I believe you characterize that as another arm of the silent cell, so to speak. Um, So I'm wondering if you could share with the listeners some of the obstacles that you face in trying to answer these very pertinent questions that you raise in the book about the role of psychotropic drugs in upholding the carceral state across a variety of institutions. I mean, th- this in fact became one of my fixations over over the years on this project was trying to document what we knew was going on, and then what, and also outlining what we didn't know, and trying to really focus on the things we didn't know and why don't we know these things? If if prisons have been using psychotropic drugs since the 1950s, um, in fact. Uh, You know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is the the fact that prisons were the testing site for pharmaceuticals for decades in the United States. You know, psychotropics entered the prison as experimental medicines, not necessarily as things they were going to, you know, use to control. So I became really focused on understanding why we didn't know certain things. We didn't actually have either the survey data the health data, we only had legal cases to really give us information about what was going on inside the prison in terms of of these pharmaceuticals and and in general, and then psychotropics in particular. One of the political commitments I made in in doing this book was, was not wanting to have to ask for permission from the prison to go in and ask them what they're doing. I had, you know, uh, uh, some experience in this area and I had reason to believe that, you know, if you, if you go into the prison, if you get access to the prison, you have to do so. First of all, there's, you know, very rigid ethical rules regarding what you can do um, and getting access to prisoners or to prisoner health records or any of the other things, you know, even just getting inside. But even getting inside would have to be framed as, you know, you're wanting to improve prisoner mental health and these other kinds of liberal goals worthwhile, but they weren't quite getting to the to the to the critical issue that I thought was important I just tried to imagine you know asking a, a, a prison doctor so um, have you observed any unconstitutional or un- unethical drugging in the last year in your facility right I mean you're essentially asking people to and and no doubt you know they might respond that they had seen <laughs> seen such things but I didn't want to have to seek permission of the prison to, to study the prison. And so I, I, I use in the book only publicly available evidence, um, things that any reasonably technologically savvy you know, citizen could find uh, themselves out there in the world. And I didn't have to pay for anything. I didn't use any FOIA requests. Every in, bit of evidence cited in the book is something that's publicly available. And you know, that to me was an important, was an important kind of political commitment and methodological commitment in, in doing this book. 
But one of the things I, I do want to highlight, though, um, I talk about in the, in, the, in the chapter in the book called The Pharmacy Prison, where um, the, there was this interesting uh, kind of, uh, it was only, I think it's kind of lucky, actually, that we stumbled upon, upon these. These are, are government audits of prison pharmacies. So because uh, states and departments of corrections and jail systems were spending so much money on pharmaceuticals through the 2000s in particular, right? The uh, state auditors and federal auditors were enlisted to go into the prison and uh, figure out what's going on. They monitored inventory systems. They uh, determined whether proper records were being kept. They looked at how uh, inmate medical records were linked to, to practices in the pharmacy, practices for storage and waste disposal. I mean, the whole looking at the, the, these pharmacies as the conduit, really, for lots of money and lots of drugs. And so um, over a period of years um, uh, with my colleague Renee Shelby and I, you know, we, we, we gathered, I think, 33 publicly available audits that show you what they're doing. Right. They, they really document how the state sees what it's, it's doing itself with respect to these practices. And so you really can can get a, a, a sense of the, the, the entire system, the economic and political system that facilitates the, the distribution of pharmaceuticals into the prison. And it was, it was a world that I hadn't seen described anywhere. And so I felt like it was important to try to describe how these different institutions uh, work together to, to get drugs from pharmaceutical companies and get them into the prison. And again, this, this, this is work I hadn't seen and documented, and so I thought it would be important to include it. I so appreciate that focus on publicly available documents, right, as, a, as a, both a political statement and as a methodology and sort of what those were able to illuminate for you. Um, and so I wanted to ask you uh, about actually chapter four, where you, you take your discussion into the realm of how psychotropics are used in what you call psychic states of emergency, right? So that's really looking at other settings of where folks are not entirely free to leave, right? Whether that is the active duty military, nursing homes, children receiving care in the foster system, and that so often you show how these drugs are given even in the absence of any kind of medical or psychiatric uh, diagnosis. So just curious if you could talk a little bit more about how institutional abuse and neglect using psychotropics, among other methods, function across these settings, similarly or differently? The central idea to start with here is pacification, right? Um, when, when an institution faces a crisis, it's got to solve the crisis somehow. And, you know, the three institutions that I explore in this chapter all have faced uh, serious population crises uh, um, in, 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 in recent decades uh, due to really inhumane social policies, right? So that, this, is the, I mean, this is the kind of sociology frame for this, is that you have institutions that have bad policies that don't support people, they get in crisis, and then the crisis has to be pacified, the crisis has to be solved, it has to be put down, the crisis has to be managed somehow. So take, for example, active duty U.S. military volunteers, right? Uh, when the United States and a coalition, so-called coalition of the willing, decided to invade the sovereign nation of first Afghanistan and then soon after Iraq in 2003, they realized that it soon faced a real problem, right? They didn't have enough volunteers to, to actually people this war. Right, that that this war, this new war on terror that they had that they had be, that that they were engaged in, that the U.S. government was engaged in, and so they changed long-standing Department of Defense policy regarding a recruits you know, of who could volunteer. So if you if you had had a serious mental health problem, or were taking psychotropic drugs, you couldn't volunteer for the U.S. military. Right, they would turn you away. Because they were they they didn't want to have to to con either deal with that they were concerned about suicide risk they were concerned about all kinds of things and they was they would say, you couldn't volunteer well they changed that policy in addition 
they be, the Department of Defense began shipping psychotropic drugs out into the live war zone um, uh, across the globe, you know, for um, soldiers to use. And so, again, they had never done this before. So they had this, 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 whole, this inhumane and unjust policy, this war policy that created a, pop, a population crisis. They needed soldiers. And so then they figured out a way to, to, to keep soldiers on the battlefield. And that is literally the language that the Department of Defense uses to describe why it's doing, to explain why it's doing what it's doing. They say they want to conserve the fighting strength, right? And so uh, they want to keep these uh, through multiple deployments uh, and really at any cost. They want to make sure that they're keeping these soldiers on the battlefield. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, and the other example, um, other institution I, I consider in this chapter, probably the one that was most, um, I mean, they're, they're all have their own violence and, and horror to them, to be honest with you. Um, but it, these, are, these are the children in the foster system. Anyone who has eyes, <laughs> whether can perceive or has empathy, can know that the U.S. foster system, it, it's just a dark place. It can be a dark place for, for young people who have already experienced much higher rates of sexual violence and trauma, other forms of abuse and neglect. And then they enter into this foster system, including the group home system. And there they are administered psychotropic drugs at you know, three, four, five times the rate of children in the in their local communities, uh, comparable communities, and you know, there's you know just countless stories of of over medication in these set in these settings to keep these kids, you know, kind of managed, right? And they're they they're, they're kind of no one wants to manage to deal with them. Also, they're not they're, the systems aren't in place to help them, uh, you know, connect to family, build family in new ways. And so they're managed in this way. And the same thing is true for elders in nursing homes. I mean, it's been, you know, for decades, government regulators and activists have tried to, to, to get a handle around, a handle on the ways that elders in nursing homes and assisted care living facilities are drugged. I mean, it's literally a cultural, like, trope of the elder in the nursing home. You can't watch a cultural representation, a movie, TV show about the nursing home and not see one elder in in a chair somewhere you know thorazined out it's kind of just part of the cultural you know zeitgeist of of this moment many of these elders are put on medica- psychotropic medications you know soon after arrival with no medical justification whatsoever uh, up to a quarter of nursing home residents who are on these on these on these drugs um don't ha- actually have a reason for being on them and you know, part of the reason for this, I, I talk about, I talk about in this chapter, is the aggressive practices of pharmaceutical companies, right? Who are actively promoting, uh, through in one case through major fraud, uh, um, their products in these in these institutions. It was you know, John, of course, Johnson and Johnson paid a huge two point two billion dollar uh, fraud settlement, um, you know, for pushing antipsychotic medications on elders for the treatment of dementia. And, and, and that was not something that they should have been doing at all. And so, you know, taken together, the way I understand what these institutions are, these are all institutions that you can't, you can't just leave. If, if you volunteer for the service, you can't just walk away from that. If you're held as an elder, you know, that some of those facilities are locked down, closed door facilities. You can't just leave. And similarly, for the kids in foster care, you're a ward of the state. The state literally has kind of a possession of the body legally. You know, the, it seems to be the case that uh, the U.S. carceral state extends far beyond the prison. These are, very, these are very much, these institutions are working very much like prisons do. You know, the sociologist Irving Goffman, you know, called them total institutions. He said that they were society's dumping grounds. And that that is it's 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 strong words, but I think it, it it seems to apply in this case. Let's look at chapter six, where uh, you talk about the killing of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman, and the fact that Zimmerman was on multiple 
psychotropic drugs at the time that you, you point out this is a fact that was greatly downplayed, right? If not outright concealed to the public. You know, many of us have noticed the same phenomenon with mass shootings, which you also talk about in the book. And so again, kind of talking about these root cause analyses, the pivot is almost always to serious mental illness, especially if the perpetrator is white, rather than to to the possible influence of the drugs themselves as violence-inducing agents, or, you know, we could even talk about suicide as well. What do you think is the societal block to exploring this correlation? Is it just too threatening to a conception of these drugs as therapeutic agents alone? Mm. You know, I've been reflecting on that. Because one of the things that, when when the book was done, this is one of the areas where I feel like the um, it's difficult for the science to speak to this question. Like it's difficult, and I write about this a little bit. It's difficult to know, as uh, from an empirical or scientific or quantit through quantitative analysis of the data on, say, mass shootings, gun violence, and psychotropic dr- drug use. It's very difficult to be able to say that these drugs are a causal factor in America's mass gun violence, you know, mass shooting epidemic, you know, whatever uh, alarmist language you, we, we, we should use because it's really remarkable <laughs> um, when, you look, when you look at our, our death rates from, from gun violence, both for, from suicides and homicides. It's, it's, it's profoundly sad, actually. But but it's very difficult empirically to show, to prove, you know, to prove, to prove this. And so we're kind of left when you don't have all the information, you're you're forced to kind of theorize what you think is going on. Like what is your what is your theoretical account? What is your how do you explain this? What I see as a pretty you know troubling linkage between um, really principally only because of course it's predominantly men and, and, and young young men who commit um, the mass uh, gun violence generally at both of the mass and not mass variety. So many of them reportedly were taking psych meds at the time of the shooting. And I wonder, you know, in the complex way in which we don't exactly know how psych meds work, like we, you know, we don't actually know what their specific mechanisms of action are in the brain. We don't, we, we know what effects they create, but we don't know how they achieve those effects. And so in some ways, it, it, there's this little black box in terms of what these, these compounds are doing to our, our brain chemistry. And people like Robert Whitaker and many other people have, have written extensively about the clinical trial research and the basic biological research into how these drugs work. And it seems to me to be hugely troubling that we don't exactly know how they work yet. We see these patterns of violence in our society to which they are linked. And so outside the United States, however, th- this linkage has been made in several European countries where they've identified that certain compounds are linked to, to, to certainly to suicide risk in, in youth and other forms of violence and de- death in society. I think that efforts to try to keep guns from the hands of people who are identified as having serious mental illness, efforts to try to, 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 to monitor their access to this, this constitutional right, whether I agree with it or not, it is a constitutional right, I think are ill-conceived. I think they, they're not considering the full, as you see, the kind of you know, a, another possible root cause that I think needs to be investigated further. So in some, in, in some ways, for me, this is one of the areas in the book where I think that more research needs to be done, you know, and, and, and researchers need to try to figure this out. Because this combination, widespread societal psychotropic drug use and mass availability of, of weapons is creating a situation where far too many of us are dying and being injured due to, due to this, this, this conflagration. Although it's, it's very difficult for me to say that A, you know, a causes B. So I want to take us to this really, really interesting analogy that you raised towards the end of the book about how institutions uh, like people can become addicted to psychotropic drugs in a whole variety of ways. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about this analysis and, and kind of how it fed into this guiding question that you raised about can the carceral state exist? without psychotropic drugs. 
Right. That that is the the big question that I tried to answer is, you know, can we have this system of mass incarceration without these drugs? And in what in other words, in what ways is our system of mass incarceration, mass captivity reliant, dependent on these drugs, these technologies to function? And you know, that that is the conclusion I come to, that these institutions, the prison, in some to some degree the military. Our, our, our elder care systems, I mean, my goodness, the system of immigrant detention, we didn't talk about this, but the use of psychotropics in privately run immigrant detention facilities is hugely problematic, um, particularly among youth. Um, and that, that is happening right now um, at the border. Um, these institutions couldn't do what they, were, what they are charged with doing if they didn't have these drugs to keep at least some people silenced right they're not doing it on everybody right i mean i think that's the one one misconception or one conception i don't want people to walk away with is that prisons and these institutions are used are drugging every single person that they possibly can with you know lines of people getting pills every day that's not exactly the picture that this book draws it, it seemed to be that the magic number leah is 20 percent if you are drugging about 20% of your population, right, that's about how many people you need. You need to keep a fifth of them down in order for things to function. So this is both a problem of their, their, them being too big. So there's far too many people held in captivity, right? You need to keep far, you need, you need the cap, systems of captivity need to be much smaller and much more highly selective um, in terms of what they're trying to do. You know, you could have, a system of mass incarceration, I mean, a system of incarceration in this country is vastly smaller. So just contributing to decarceration would be would be one way to solve this problem. But these institutions have to rely on these drugs because that's the only way they can keep things going. I mean, it's just kind of very simple, right? They, they can't, the business as usual requires that they be able to manage both people who have, who they believe and who do in fact ha- experientially have serious mental disorder, as well as that other fringe element, that other random unruly element that must be, um, you know, or is that is just, you know, just taking too much labor, right? So for example, in nursing homes, they're drugging people not because they're, you know, causing fights and stuff, but because they, they, you don't have to attend to them as much, right? It's in some ways cheaper to just drug them. And who cares if it's cheaper? I mean, it's really cynical of me to say that, but, you know, like an addict, alcoholic, they'll spend their last dime, you know, for the next drink. And these institutions are spending enormous amounts of money on on pharmaceuticals generally, but on psychotropics in particular. One of the the facts I tried to prove in this book or or, or support or uh, evidence in this book was that the United States government in all of its institutional diversity, is the single largest purchaser of psychotropic drugs in the world by far. And we have to ask as a citizenry, as a people, why? This is our, it's supposed to be our government. And so, so we're, we're basically funding our government to, to, to incapacitate many of us. The, the, the brilliant legal scholar, Patricia Williams, uses language I draw in the book to describe this. And she uses the language of spirit murder. That, you know, this spirit murder is, involves a, a disregard for those people whose lives qualitatively depend on our regard. So these are people that, whose lives depend on us caring about them because they're in a position of vulnerability. They literally are held captive. They re- we have to care for them. And our constitution, you know, to, to the extent that you, you adhere to it, uh, demands that. Basic human decency demands that. You know, uh, the social justice demands that we care for these people and not you know, subordinate them. And again, you know, and I just, I just want to stress one last point about this, Leah, because you know, one of the, the things I've learned in, in, in working on this project and in teaching about the history, kind of sociology of mental health uh, at Wesleyan, you know, I teach a class called Anti-Psychiatry, which explores the anti-psychiatry movement, the history of that movement, uh, intellectual history of that movement, and its social history. And, you know, one of the things I've learned from, from, from teaching that class, from, from researching this, this work and, and, and staying connected to what's been happening in community settings is that, 
you know, is not to say that these medications are not helping people survive, right? Because for many, many people, they are. And, you know, it is not to say that every person who is using a psychotropic drug is a pawn in this grand conspiracy to subordinate society psychically. Um, but it is to say that we can't allow that, that meaning of psychotropics as therapy, as medicine, as healing, to keep us from looking at ways in which they're being used for harm. And so we're looking carefully at those harms, and they are institutionally patterned. And this is the other point that I make in that concluding chapter, is that when, when the individual drug addict is wreak, wreaking havoc in their own life, and everybody, you know, they, they describe people in recovery, describe it as a tornado. You're just a tornado wrecking everybody's world around you. These institutions ha- are creating effects. We can, we can document them and see them. And those patterns of effects on people's lives are related to these, 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 these drugs and how they're used. And, and that needs to be investigated. And really, you know, the, what I call for in the book, they, we need, they, there needs to be a kind of a sobering moment, you know, a uh, moment where we kind of, we stop and really think about what we're doing <laughs> with, with so much pharmacopoeia. You know, do we have to have this much pharmacopoeia? I mean, it seems, like a, it seems to me like a huge experiment. And it's the worst kind of experiment because it's the one where no, one, no, no one's watching. Like the scientists are, are off the clock. And that to me is, it needs to be fixed. So that takes me really to looking at the next extension, right, of, of psychotropic drugs, which is uh, innovative uses of technology to administer the drugs in new ways, but often to the same, you know, populations and groups of folks you talk about uh, in your book. So I, came, I first came across your work actually while doing research on Abilify My Site, uh, which for for the listeners is an antipsychotic that contains a sensor that will tell the care provider whether or not you took your pill and may provide some other biological data. Um, And you said in this piece that was uh, originally published in the conversation, pills with embedded sensors mark a new era in digital health. And I believe herald the arrival of a new kind of digital cyborg identity. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about this conception of how psychotropics are evolving. What does that look like vis-a-vis your own research? I mean, this was a remarkable event in my mind. This was in 2017 where Otsuka Pharmaceuticals uh, had, had formed in a partnership with Proteus Digital Health, and they, you know, sought FDA and, and, and sought and won FDA approval for this Abilify My Site, which again, the form of the pill itself contains a sensor, and then the, the user, the consumer of the pharmaceutical wears a patch on their skin that um, is the kind of the receives this, the transmission from inside the body. So in the way there's a, these bioenzymes that are registered when the pill is consumed. So it's a really um, sci-fi, uh, you know, a futuristic kind of, of, of or enterprise designed really to treat adherence. So, you know, the, the, the idea here is that you're going to take this Abilify My Site um, so that the doctor and yourself here and your family even uh, can know that you took the drug. I mean, it's really to, to ensure that you take it to improve adherence rates. Um, and uh, we were talking about before before the before the interview today that Proteus Digital Health is in financial trouble. They 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 they're not, they're not making enough money, right? The, the Sibilify My Site, again, which came out two years ago, is not really taking root in 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 community settings. It's not. It seems unnecessary, actually, and and partly because we know that adherence to to a drug regime is not just a digital problem right, or technological problem. It's a social one. People we we know from you know, from the research that you got to have people have to have adequate family and social support if they're going to take medication on, on a regular basis, to have the financial means to take that medication regularly, if, if again, if that's what their treatment plan indicates. So maybe this Abilify My Site was, was, was destined to fail. They should have perhaps done better market research before they did it, before they put it out there. But um, my colleague, Ruha Benjamin, who's been writing in, in brilliantly about race and technology and technology and ethics for years, you know, raises this question, you know, just because we can do something, should we? 
just because we have the technological means and wherewithal to, to do something new, should we? And I think all, you know, many of these new developments in digital health, digital therapeutics, of which Abilify My Site is one, raise that question for us, right? Um, why do we have to be transformed into these kind of cybernetic figures in order to receive and to be cared for? Why is that? Why do we have to, to essentially um, bind with, infuse with, and hybridize with corporate technology? Uh, there are uh, many other health conditions for which you know t- technologies like this are are currently deployed. So it's not to say that this is, but this I think this was a new, new, a new development. And one I, f- I feared at the time would be, would be a problem, although, you know, because maybe because, uh, you know, Proteus Digital Health isn't doing well, I wouldn't assume that that means we've seen the last of these kinds of, of technologies. And, you know, people, I think people really ought to think carefully about what they, what they mean. Absolutely. And how the profit motive is also so much a part of this with patent expiration and how these pharmaceutical companies can basically get a whole new lease on their drugs if they collaborate with a different delivery system, Uh, which actually brings me to kind of this bigger question of techno corrections, you know, which you reference in your book um, as kind of this whole array of technologies and strategies that are being deployed to decrease the cost of mass incarceration or maybe fuel uh, projects of decarceration, as well as to manage the quote-unquote risks uh, that are posed by prisoners to society. Um, and So just sort of thinking about, in addition to all you discuss in the book, uh, you and I have talked about the Response Act, uh, which was recently introduced by Republican Senator John Cornyn of Texas as a response to the back-to-back mass shootings. But there's a particular preoccupation in this bill with care transitions, right? Which, which in this context might mean people returning citizens who are, are leaving uh, jails and prisons and ensuring that there is no interruption in the psychotropic drugging of these populations. So it, it, the bill makes several references to long-acting injections. So it might not be a microchipped pill quite yet, but these long-acting injections in the name of continuity of care during re-entry. So do you think that this is just another version of silent cells to, to extend the walls of the prison in the name of decarceration into the community, especially if you consider it alongside a whole other variety of monitoring technologies that uh, returning citizens are subjected to? What a great question. And I looked at the Response Act, right? And it is, it, it, is, it is a curious thing. On the one hand, it seems to provide much needed resources and societal focus, you know, uh, opportunities, we were joking before, for bipartisan consensus on something, I suppose, the leaders figuring out how to, how to care for people. But it also comes with this other side, right? This, this expansion of the state's efforts to surveil and coordinate and monitor the citizenry and to monitor the, the, psych- the psychological well-being of the citizenry and to control it. That is done in the name of, of ostensibly of reducing risk, of reducing harm, increasing safety, creating a sense of security, a feeling of security. At the very end of Silent Cells, I kind of went off in the, for the last paragraph because I, I realized what was What's being produced through the application of techno corrections is a feeling of affective security, a feeling that we're safe from this dangerous other. It's not actually, it's not really security. And, and there really is no, that's not the danger. The danger comes in the mechanism of control used to create this feeling. And so it, there's this, it's this magical kind of process, I think, where the, the technology, somehow, we lose sight of it. it we, it's acting on us, it's core, it, it, but yet we don't, we don't quite see what it's, what it's doing to us and how it's ordering society and how the technology is building a world that we have to then inhabit. The Response Act and really any effort to, to extend the boundaries of carcerality 
it has to be viewed in this context, right? I mean, the argument in Silent Cells is that why, no, you don't really no longer need the physical cell of the physical prison if you can create the prison in a person's mind. So if you create a psychic prison, a mental prison, you no longer need the jail itself. And so the, the very meaning of, of what it means to be institutionalized is at stake. Right. So if we extend these technologies out into the so-called non-correctional world, they will continue. They, they're expanding that domain of, of captivity to the point where I think we have to say whether, you know, it, you know, people often make this distinction between, you know, the being in the prison and being so-called free. But I don't I don't see being free as being free as such. Right. I think where there's a there's a kind of a coercion and institutionalization that happens out here. Well, there was one study. Of, uh, of recently released citizens that asked the question of if they were on a psychotropic drug while they were incarcerated and then they got out, um, how would they ac- continue to access medicine? And what, would, what was the relationship between the, their need to get their med and the risk of reoffending? right? So, and what they found, surprise, is that these persons who had been on psych meds while incarcerated got out they had they were given a you know 15 30 day supply once that ran out they would go and buy whatever you know illicit substances they could find and they would reoffend many of them did right and so there is this this relationship between you know and so on one hand the response act by extending what you might think of as care is really just changing who gets paid <laughs> to be honest with you it's really just changing who benefits and you know, pharmaceutical interests have long known that the prison is a central site for profit making. Yeah, and what a an absolutely uh, sobering um, yet incredibly important note. I'm appreciative of the way that you connected these dots, both within the prison walls, beyond the prison walls, across a whole variety of settings that compose the carceral state, and really, yeah, exposing who or what is profiting, right, in this increased blending of care and coercion uh, across our society. So once again, uh, I want to thank you so, so much uh, for taking the time to be with us on the podcast today. Really, really grateful uh, for your scholarship and focus on liberatory science. Thank you so much again, Dr. Anthony Ryan Hatch, for being with us today. Thank you so much. Let's continue the good work. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.